Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Tonight, my very special guest is Muhammad Valley, a specialist in patents. The other areas that we'll be covering tonight are copyright and trademark as well. Muhammad, assalamu alaikum and welcome. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah for having, uh, having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Muhammad has got a very distinguished career as a specialist uh, attorney. He studied at, uh, he graduated from Trinity High and then he moved into the field of biosciences uh, at uh, UJ, uh, as it was then, uh, it was known as Rao at that time. And then he concurrently obtained a law degree, uh, which is very interesting. And then he started with uh, DM Kirsch. So, as, as a clerk and today he's a full director. So it, it kind of shows that he had a commitment to a very specialized field of law at a very early age. Uh, Mohammed, w what does one understand by intellectual property? You know, when we talk about patents and copyrights and trademarks, the law speaks of intellectual property. What are we to understand by the term intellectual property? Well, Ashraf, generally the term intellectual property refers to creations of the mind. And these can take various embodiments, for example, what we call patents. Um, patents basically cover inventions, um, and we'll get into what an invention is in relation to a patent in a few minutes. Other forms of intellectual property include copyright, trademarks, if you, as you've rightly pointed out, but it also includes confidential information trade secrets, uh, um, company propriety, conf confidential information, client lists, and that sort of thing. And another form of intellectual property rights is what's known as design registrations. And we can go through, through each of those categories in a few minutes. So they say necessity is the mother of all invention. And, and, and we're speaking basically about patent inventions. Now, uh, with regard to uh, the Islamic history of, of inventions and patents, I mean, if you go to the uh, Ibn Battuta Mall in Dubai, you get a good sense of, of how Muslim uh, scientists contributed to, say, uh, medical instruments and blood flows, etc. What, what do we know about the history of patents uh, and intellectual property in uh, Islamic uh, history? Well, Ashraf, it's a very interesting point that you raise, and uh, the Islamic world is no stranger to innovation and inventions. And in fact, there's an illustrious history um, uh, that, that Muslims can be proud of, where innovation has stood proud on, on, on the shoulders of development through the golden era of Islam, uh, particularly developments in Europe. If one goes and searches uh, through Google, there's a number of websites which detail Muslim inventions, uh, Muslim innovations, and extraordinary feats that uh, Muslims have now brought to the Western world that we currently use today. Um, if you do a general Google search through right. or, or looking for um, 1001 Muslim inventions, you'll come to a couple of websites that uh, the readers can have the benefit of, of reading th in, in their idle time to see exactly where um, Muslims have contributed. I've got a little memo here just to give some examples uh, for the benefit of the viewers to understand what we're talking of. Um, coffee. Right. Something is, is, is ubiquitous as is, is coffee. We, we all drink it several yeah. times a day. I'm yeah. sure you do. Um, that was, or it's said to be invented by an Ethiopian shepherd by the name of Khalid. I'm just going to reference my notes here. Um, and the story is that he noticed that his animals became livelier after consuming a certain type of, of berry. And he went and he boiled those berries, and that's where you, uh, the first cup of coffee was, was brewed. Um, but not only in, in, in terms of coffee, there's um, other areas, for example, medicine. Yes. There's uh, uh, <clears throat> a, lo a lot of information about a particular Muslim scientist who developed surgical tools and surgical techniques that are still used today. Um, and his <coughs> excuse me, textbooks that yes. uh, detail surgical techniques was the authority that was used in Europe for at least uh, 500 years after, after he passed 
passed on. I think algebra is another example. Algebra certainly is, and in fact, that's where the word comes from. The Arabic word algebra um, is where uh, the word algebra, right. as we know it today, comes from. But um, I'm going to try and, and, and look through some names. Um, but inst interestingly enough, uh, the camera that everybody has in their cell phone, yes, that came from Ibn Hazm. Yes. Um, he was the first to describe what's known as the camera obscura, which is basically a projected image through a pinhole onto a darkened area within right. a darkened room. And the Arabic word for darkened room is camera. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's these little gems of, of wisdom I think that it's, one yeah, can pick that, up. That's how the uh, Afrikaans uh, camera also came about. Quite possibly. I haven't looked into it, but I wouldn't say that you're wrong or far off. But, uh, what about tulips? You were telling us some interesting things about uh, the, the types of flowers that the Netherlands is, is famous for. Yes, absolutely. Tulips and carnations were actually innovations that derived from the medieval Muslim world in Europe. Um, my reading of, of that particular topic was that whereas uh, the western part of Europe, if we can call it that, were more interested in growing plants for purposes of feeding their people, the Muslim world had developed gardens for purposes of relaxing and for beautification of their properties. And uh, these are two particular distinct plant varieties that the Muslim world contributed to that we see today. That's a very interesting background. Now, look, South Africa is known for a number of patents worldwide. Uh, the creepy crawly, uh, prestic, um, doloses that are used to, um, uh, made out of concrete to keep the sea, sea walls uh, intact. There's just to mention a few. Now, obviously, that meant that we are, you know, we're a nation of inventors. They, 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 these things have, have, uh, have reached the far corners of the world. Typically, let's say if I have an idea and I think, look, I'd like to patent this. Well, what would be the first step and what should I be looking out for um, when, when I'm embarking on a journey to, to protect my idea? Okay. <clears throat> Well, first and foremost, phone your local patent attorney. That's uh, <laughs> typically the first thing that you should do. But in preparation of your consultation with your patent attorney, what you ought to do is firstly understand exactly what it is that you're innovating in relation to. So you define what's known as the state of the art. The state of the art is everything that's been done before, whether through written or oral disclosure or through use or in any other way. Um, once you define what the state of the art is, now you look towards your invention and so, you measure. So, sorry, by that you mean a historical narrative of what exists already. When Precisely. you say state of the art, let's say I'm designing a cold ring bottle. Right. Okay, so I've got to go into what cold ring bottles are up to date, how many varieties, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's the state of the art. That's precisely the point. Right. In order to go forward, you need to know what's been done before. Right. And that's really the inquiry, so that you are able to gauge and measure what the difference is that you're bringing as a contribution to the particular area of technology that's under consideration. Once you understand what those differences are, you can then meaningfully engage your patent attorney to say, this is the improvement that I would want protection in. Can we, can we file a patent application here? Now, there, there is a distinction. One can have an invention, but one need not necessarily have a patent in respect of that invention. And by this distinction, I mean that there are certain requirements under the Patents Act that you have to meet right. uh, in order to have a patent right granted to you. And let's, let's dig in a little bit here about patent rights. What are patent rights? Um, essentially, a patent is a right that's uh, granted by the state to an innovator in order to reward him for his contribution to the state of technology and the improvement on the existing state of technology for a limited time period. Um, so the patent is the right in respect of the invention and the, the invention right. is the improvement that you've given to society or you've presented to society. Now, patent rights are fashioned on what's known as the reward theory. Mm -hmm. And the reward theory is really a quid pro quo. Right. The quid is you give a disclosure of your invention to the general public and in consideration the pro quo um, for your disclosure the state awards you a limited time monopoly in South Africa that time period is 20 years from the date of filing your complete patent application um, so but the actual process of filing 
uh, let's say I have the idea today and I have the design uh, and I approach my patent attorney. Okay. So what period of time between my, uh, my approaching the attorney and the first registration, what is the time period that we're looking at? Well, it really depends on um, the quality of your instruction and the type of research that your patent attorney is going to have to do in order to prepare a written disclosure in what's known as a patent specification. That is the instrument that not only defines what your invention is and instructs the public on how to go about repeating your invention, which is the quid that I mentioned earlier, um, but it also has a set of claims, right. and those claims define the forbidden territory. So not only do you instruct the public on what your invention relates to, you're also telling your public where they cannot trample on. Right. And, and in the modern context in South Africa, the patents and things that you're seeing uh, on a daily basis uh, is, is in what field more? Well, I think the, the general worldwide trend is more in the field of uh, electronic engineering, your cell phones, your, um, um, your internet... Uh, Protocol. I forget the word. <laughs> uh, your... Um, Ah, I'll come back to that yes. now. But basically, the general field of electronic engineering where you have these uh, electronic products covered by patents, the trend is currently moving in that direction. Ten years ago, the, the greater um, um, number of patent applications finding its way into various patent offices around the world, not only South Africa, was in relation to pharmaceuticals. All right. So there are different, uh, definite trends and different shifts in respect of various... Uh, areas of technology and expertise. But with regard to electronics, you actually mean the physical product of how this thing works. For example, a chip that can hold, say, 10 million bytes of uh, information as opposed to 1 million uh, bytes of information, that, that kind of uh, innovation. Yeah, absolutely. Not only is it in respect of the completed product that you are able to purchase off uh, the shop's shelves, but also components in respect of the manufacture of those products. <clears throat> Your computer chips, um, hardware that allow programs to, uh, to operate and execute particular tasks in respect of those particular products. It can also be in respect of a super specialization. So not only would um, the product, as you see it, yes. be in relation to electronic en uh, or an electronic concept, yes. but there could be different things that form part of a patent. For example, the material, the plastic polymer material that makes up the, the casing of the product right. could have certain patentable characteristics. It could be heat proof, it uh, could whatever, be heat -proof, it, uh, it waterproof. Could, uh, yeah, now, absolutely. Now, just on the back of electronic development, you know, the, we're living in the world of apps, applications, and people are writing apps every day. Every day on your phone, you get a new app. In fact, there's a very interesting app that's just come onto the South African market to identify potholes, which is a big thing. Right. Um, and they, it came hot off the, the back of a Netherlands uh, invention. But in the ne Netherlands, when your car hits a bump, it can identify whether that's a pothole or just an ordinary depression in the road. And it sends a message to the road authorities. I know the JRA is looking at uh, uh, rolling out the uh, technology here, but there is certainly an app. Now, let's say you develop this thing called an app. Is that a patent or how is that protected? Well, one has to, to interrogate what the solution really is because there could be an overlapping of rights. Um, in relation to a computer program, which is what the app would ac execute, really, uh, computer programs are competent subject matter under the provisions of the Copyright Act. Right. The object code and the source code that defines the computer program, that is copyright, uh, copyrightable work, if I can use the, the term in a loose sense. But if there's a technical solution where the app interacts with certain pieces of hardware to achieve an unexpected result or a result that uh, wouldn't have been expected, something synergistic or something unexpected in the normal course, mm -hmm. that could be the proper subject of, of patent protection. So let's uh, pause for a second and just make a distinction that if we can, for the viewer's benefit in trying not to be too technical about what yeah. a patent is, you can consider a patent to be uh, in relation to, let's call it an invention. Right. An invention where there's a problem of whatever that problem may be, 
in your particular example, the problem is that one doesn't really have a means with which to effectively and immediately communicate the existence of a pothole. Right. Um, that would be the problem. And the solution would be to take existing pieces of hardware and to combine it in a unique way to achieve a particular solution. That could be the subject of a patent. So that would be your invention All right. or your concept that could later find itself in a particular working embodiment. But the packaging that your product could be presented in, in shop shelves to, to customers, the packaging could be the subject of copyright in relation to the artwork, in relation to the, the text that features on products to describe how the product works or to give a general description of the product. Um, but the name of your product. Yeah. Now, that's a different category of rights, and that would be a trademark. And a trademark is um, either a name or a logo or a payoff line um, that basically instructs the public um, what your product is um, in, in terms of a name, and it associates that product with your company name. So it creates that, um, that psychological connection to say, well, this is a particular application that Ashraf's company innovated, and there's an immediate connection. So you're seen as the innovator in this instance. Mm -hmm. Anyone who comes subsequently with a similar product would probably be seen to be a pirate or a copier or an afterthought. Um, that's a different category of rights, trademarks. Um, I've mentioned copyright uh, a few times now, but I haven't explained what copyright is. Yeah. Copyright is a right that subsists in relation to certain pieces of work. And these works could be literary works, right. um, artistic works, um, photo photographical works, uh, broadcast signals, anything that can be reduced to a material form. But the content as an idea, assume that you've, you've got your idea that uh, you, in, in relation to this app, yeah. that wouldn't be protectable under the Copyright Act. It's merely the presentation of that information that is protected under copyright, right. whereas the idea would be protected under patent. So you can already see that uh, these rights intersect and they overlap to some degree in relation to a given business scenario. Um, if your, say for instance, your app communicates through a certain device and that device has a particular um, aesthetic value yes. in relation to how it's perceived with the eye, that aesthetic feature of your device could be the proper subject of design protection. Right. And now we come to confidential information. There's certain things that you don't want to disclose to the public because... For example, a Coca-Cola formula. Precisely. Yes. Precisely. And that's the reason why Coca-Cola is probably so uh, successful to date. It's because that recipe was never made public. It was kept confidential through years and years and years of Coca-Cola being on, on the market. And that also contains or provides a competitive edge to yes. your business. Okay, it's time for a short break. Uh, please stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. And then we'll be taking calls from our viewers. And we'll invite you to call us on 011-086-7701-2-3. Stroke stroke Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the second part of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Um, as I said before the break, you're welcome to call in on 011-086-7701. My very special guest tonight is Mohamed Valley, a specialist patent attorney. He could also talk about copyrights and trademarks. Any questions regarding patents, what is an invention, how it's protected, might be of interest to you, and uh, we invite you to call in. Mohamed, just uh, going forward, um, is it true that only big business has a uh, stake in patents? I mean, uh, no, certainly not. Um, big businesses are obviously very aware of patents and the benefits that it holds. But we've come across clients from all walks of life, uh, from the ordinary man in the street to, to multinational corporations seeking to have their inventions protected. Um, give, give us an example of an ordinary person having successfully uh, uh, registered a patent and made some money from it. Okay, I've, I've come across um, a U.S. housewife, ordinary housewife, no 
tertiary education, no particular expertise in any particular field. Um, she was walking one day through a supermarket and had the idea to put a purse pack handle on a shopping trolley right. and use that area to advertise information. Very and simple but effective. Absolutely simple. In fact, the simpler the idea, the stronger the patent and the more easily the patent can be commercialized. And uh, not only did she get a granted US patent, but uh, she successfully commercialized it to the extent that we've seen that invention feature in, in the South African context. I don't know whether or not she's still um, the patentee of that patent. There's obviously many ways that one can commercialize your invention. Uh, but we've certainly seen the benefit of that idea in the local scene. But you know, you bring an important point now, because is it not true that patents are territorial in nature? So here's a woman in the US who's, who's come up with this idea, but it's permeated into the South African supermarket scene. How does she ensure protection here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Patents are indeed territorial in nature. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you want protection in a particular jurisdiction, you would have to make an application for that patent in that jurisdiction. Um, in as many as 146 countries in the world, if you want worldwide protection, you have to make 146 applications for patent protection. Right. There are regional systems which deal with um, a single application which results in a grant in a number of countries, but the bottom line is that there's no, let's dispel the mystery, there's no such a thing as a worldwide patent. So there's not a single patent that covers multiple territories um, across borders. For example, a South African patent would find no application in the US, right. unless you have an equivalent US application that has been filed and granted there. Would uh, that also apply to, uh, to copyright? Uh, l let's say, for example, I mean, we both know the two, probably the most famous copyright is Coca-Cola. Now, Coke will go into every country, but it'll never change its logo or its name. You can buy Coca-Cola in China or in Mongolia. It's the same product. So right. that's not the same as a patent, but the copyright, I take it, would be easier to register in all jurisdictions. Um, yes. Um, well, it's a multi-pronged answer to the question on copyright. Copyright is what's known as a non-registrable right. Okay. As compared to a patent or a design registration where you have to make a physical application, direct that application to the patent or designs office in the locality that you want protection in. Um, but copyright is different. The minute you reduce a work to a material format and provided that work is an original work, meaning it emanated from you as the author, copyright will subsist in that work. And there are certain ways that you can instruct the public uh, as to the existence of your copyright. And it's something that you, you see in films, uh, probably in books and a number of other uh, literary works. Right. It's the copyright symbol, C with a circle, yes. the year in which it was first produced, um, all rights reserved in the name of the author. And that's where copyright subsists. So if uh, a company such as Coca-Cola has a copyrightable work right. that it seeks protection in, in a number of jurisdictions, it wouldn't uh, need necessarily file ap ap um, applications in various jurisdictions because of the automatic subsistence of copyright under an international instrument known as the Berne Convention. Right. Member states of that convention or that legal instrument would give recognition to, to Coca-Cola's copyright. So it's easier, if I can just interpret, it's easier to have copyright protection than patent. Patents is territorial and then you have to register in each jurisdiction, but a copyright subsists. In, in the creation of the work itself, and it's protected by various conventions. Yes, absolutely. Now, um, we we'll take it one step further, just uh, to bring clarity to the position. In South Africa, uh, the grant of a patent happens as a matter of course, because South Africa is a deposit system. So you file your application for a patent, and right. that application would proceed to grant. Um, but in other jurisdictions, such as the US or Europe, Australia for that matter, mm -hmm. those are known as examining jurisdictions. Right. So your application is then considered by an examiner <coughs> who has a qualification in the particular field that your invention falls in. Yes. And he, will then, he or she would then do a search to consider whether or not your patent is in fact patentable subject matter. S sorry, your invention is yes. patentable subject matter meaning that it meets the requirements of novelty and inventive step. Um, we can elaborate on, on that if, 
if you yeah, give me the I, I, Before we do that, what I wanted to ask you is recently, not, not so uh, long ago, I came across a matter which is very interesting. So we know the Quran uh, was, uh, is, is the divine word of Allah, SWT. Now, what had happened is uh, a particular person took the Quran and he, he created color coding. And the color coding was meant to assist you in tajweed and pronunciation. And some other um, bookshop tried to print this. And the, and the original uh, author of the color-coded color Qur'an took umbrage, he objected to that. What do you say about that? Is that possible? Is that recommended? Um, I wouldn't know about the, the answer to the question on recommendation, but yes, it, it certainly is possible. Um, let's start off by stating that the Qur'an, the text of the Qur'an, that is uh, open to the public. Right. There, there would be no copyrighted verse in the Qur'an, in the Arabic or the text of the Quran in whatever language it may appear, because that is the word of God. Um, but if there's a derivative work, if somebody has gone and applied a certain uniqueness to that text, for example, um, or your example is color actually coding. quite apposite, uh, color coding of the pronunciation, yeah. case, the Tajweed, that is a work that would be eligible for copyright because there is a difference. There is an application of some form of, um, I wouldn't say ingenuity, but certainly it advances the state of the current art to a certain degree. It wouldn't be competent to file patent protection or design protection or even a trademark, but in relation to what you've described, copyright would certainly be a uh, suitable subject matter. And we can extend the example by making reference to CDs right. where there's uh, Quranic recitations. The recitation per se, that isn't eligible for copyright, but uh, certainly the manner of recitation or the uniqueness of the reciter's voice, yes. that could be subject of a copyright if it's reduced to a material form, for example, an audio CD or DVD or whatever visual means through which the recitation is going to, to feature certainly would be subject of, of uh, or the proper subject of copyright. Now, I mean, just to, to bring an, another point in, you know, if you go to Fordsburg um, Square or you go to any other corner um, on, on the uh, highway, you, you find vendors selling you CDs. Okay, now right. those CDs appear to be in a proper packaging, uh, you know, with the with the color of the of the movie or whatever the case is. Now, is that is that sale an infringement of copyright itself? Well, it could represent a number of infringements. Um, for example, if the trademark that uh, the original proprietor is using has been copied and used in what you're describing as a pirated copy, there would certainly be trademark infringement considerations arising from from that sale. Um, but also, yes, infringement of copyright, because if the, the recording was simply copied yes. and utilized in a manner where the, the manufacturer or the seller is representing that this is an original work, right. uh, when it's not, copyright certainly would be infringed there. But it also touches on another area of intellectual property, which we haven't mentioned, um, counterfeiting. Yes. Um, there is actually a counterfeit good uh, um, product. product. Yes. Um, and the reason why is because the representation that's made to the public is that this is the goods of the original manufacturer when it's not. It's yeah. actually goods of inferior quality that has simply been slavishly copied without any benefit accruing to the original owner. Um, so yes, that has criminal sanctions, as does the Copyright Act, but it also has civil sanctions. Yes. And the manufacturer and or seller can be interdicted and sued for damages. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's 5,000 rand per item. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the uh, criminal conviction, you could be convicted. That's right, in the local context. And um, if that act of infringement is spread into other countries, there's greater sanctions. So you can face heavy, heavy sanctions from, uh, from various countries. And what about um, uh, parallel imports? Now, we know parallel imports to refer to goods, uh, referred to as grey goods. But the definition, I think the most famous case was Frank and Hirsch versus Rupin and Brothers. At that time, they were talking about the TDK tapes, right. were C60 and C90 when, when, when uh, 
audio tapes were still popular. I don't want to reveal my age, but I do recall those, <laughs> those varieties. <laughs> but, but I think that was the leading case on that. Uh, wh what's our understanding of, uh, of a parallel import or a grey good? Okay, let's contextualize it. Um, a grey good is a product that emanates from the original manufacturer, but it doesn't pass through an authorized distributor or representative of that manufacturer located in South Africa. So someone can go overseas, they can purchase an original uh, product or product that's produced by, let's call it uh, the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. And they can bring it down into South Africa and they can sell it. It's perfectly legal to do so. Um, and the reason why is because of a principle known as the exhaustion of rights. Um, there can be no sanction that comes from the OEM or the original equipment manufacturer simply because the sale by any of his other distributors in yeah. any other country is a perfectly valid and legal sale. But what it does, it cuts out the ability of the local representative, the local distributor, to sell products to the local market. And the reason why these goods are referred to as grey goods is because no guarantee would then be made in respect of these goods by the local distributor. So uh, let's just take the, the TDK example again. So Frank and Hirsch was the authorized distributor from the Japanese company. Rupin and Brothers went to Singapore and they bought the goods from an authorized dealer. Both the goods were original and legal and came from the original manufacturer or under license. Yeah. But when it came into South Africa, Frank and Hirsch was not liable to honor any guarantee of the goods sold by Rupin and Brothers. Um, well, the other way around, Rupin and Brothers um, have no obligation to meet any guarantees or expectations by a company or a customer who purchased that product from somebody, from somebody else. Right. And now recently, uh, I mean, just a, a step away, you know, there was the, the talk of the polo mark uh, and, and the goods that followed there. Right. What's your understanding of, of that dispute? Yeah, that was an interesting dispute. Um, my reading of that matter was that a local company had registered uh, its own polo mark as a trademark registration in South Africa many years before um, the Ralph Lauren polo mark, which is the polo mark that we all um, uh, associate. Or the original, or as the original. we know it, yes. Um, Ralph Lauren didn't have a South African presence yet or at the time when, when the, uh, the local South African polo, um, let's was call it company, yes. was registered. And, you know, it goes back to a very basic principle, first in time is stronger in law. And because there was a preceding registration in South Africa um, that a South African company owned, right. when Ralph Lauren attempted to enter the South African market, <clears throat> He was prevented from doing so because of the pre-existing rights right. held by the South African company. And I'm basing this then on, on, on media reports that I've read. There was some form of an agreement that instead of debating the issue as to who was the person entitled to the polo trademark, yeah. they decided to enter into an agreement to coexist. So Un unlike uh, the, the dispute surrounding the GAP trademark, which I think the AM Mullah group took, uh, yeah. took on years ago and then Stutterford's brought the Gap label in and then there was a, there was a huge amount of litigation and at the end of the day very exhaustive. That's right. Uh, that dispute lasted for about 15 years by my count. Um, Gap decided to dispute the validity of the local company's Gap trademark on the basis that uh, its own trademark was so well known worldwide that it divested the local company of any claim to its own trademark. Mm, I think the same applied to McDonald's when they first came in. There was, McDonald's mark was expunged due to non-use, uh, maybe due to apartheid, whatever the case is. But then a local company took up the McDonald's mark and registered the name McDonald's. But uh, legislation was passed to actually favor the original McDonald's mark here. That's right. And uh, it would have been f uh, under the same considerations of being such a well-known trademark that there's an immediate association with the word McDonald's to the McDonald's food chain, um, as would Coca-Cola be. You cannot file a trademark in, in South Africa for any product bearing the name Coca-Cola, even though it's not related to a beverage. 
So you can't uh, produce tires and call it Coca-Cola because that mark is so well known. The association is existing and it's immediate. All right. And that's the reason why you cannot. You, you would be riding off a reputation that you're not entitled to ride off. Now, let's say I have a bright idea uh, and I want to invent uh, something that, uh, that I've thought about. Does the South African government support inventions, innovation in any way? Is there any incentives? Do they assist you in, in uh, do they give you help in any kind? And what, yes. what kind of help would that be? Um, look, absolutely. South Africa is historically known as a very innovative con uh, country. You've touched on a couple of prime examples, uh, Creepy Crawley being one of the most well-known South African inventions that have been quite successful. Um, and the government has recognized that patenting processes are extraordinarily expensive and it doesn't want to stifle the inventive capacity of local South Africans. And in order to assist uh, the budding inventor who could be um, a guy sitting and tinkering in, in his garage or, it, uh, or, or an upstart company right. looking to secure its uh, invention by way of patents. Um, there are organizations that uh, one can go to for government funding. Mm -hmm. Technology Information, uh, Innovation Agency or TIA is one example. The IDC, the Industrial Development Corporation, is another example. You need to go with a business plan and you would probably need to go with a provisional patent already filed before the South African Patent Office for your proposal to be taken seriously. A due diligence investigation would then be conducted by members of these organizations to see if your invention is really something that can um, proceed mm -hmm. to commercial success. Because it's one thing having a patent uh, registration or a copyright in relation to a work or even a trademark registration for your product. Um, it's meaningless. Those rights are all meaningless if you don't undertake commercial processes which translate those rights into commercial gain. Right. Um, so part of the consideration that TIA or the IDC would undertake is whether or not there is potential for commercial success in relation to your invention. Right. And one of three scenarios can, can come about. You can either be accepted um, um, under certain conditions, so they would uh, prepare a contract where you have to meet certain deliverables. Uh, for example, you have to secure patent uh, filings in certain jurisdictions and then you have to go and obtain your development and tooling in relation to whatever product it is that you, you're going to produce. Um, and once you meet those deadlines, certain yeah. funds would be released to you to enable you to carry on with your cash flow. Um, and the uh, a different um, uh, a scenario that, that could emanate from, from the approach to these organizations is they will give you funding um, on, on, uh, on soft terms by way of a loan. Right. So you take the money, you do whatever you need to do in order to, to, to make your product a commercial success, and once you start earning revenue, you start paying them back. Um, there are also instances where a grant without any payment terms or any obligations is given to you so that you can make a success out of your product. Uh, another scenario that could also permeate out of, of, of this approach would be they will grant you certain uh, limited amounts of funds, but they would expect to take an equity stake in whatever vehicle, uh, company or CC that you're going to be trading your product through. So they um, really encourage you to be an innovator and take advantage of what uh, support they could give you, including uh, bringing the product to market. I think in terms of the innovation hub uh, based in Pretoria, they would even give you marketing assistance for your for your idea if it uh, obviously stands up to uh, uh, to rigorous uh, testing that they, that they expect. They. Yeah, absolutely. Look, you know, we were talking about uh, patents and it being territorial in nature. Now, you know, the fear that most people have is if you invent something today, the Chinese will simply take it, copy it tomorrow and, and flood the market and the world with that. Now, let's say if I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm holding a patent in South Africa and somebody copies my idea overseas, uh, as long as that, that uh, item doesn't enter the republic, uh, I, I, don't have, uh, I don't really have a leg to stand on. Once it enters the republic, then my patent protects it. So, so in a way, 
your patent is only as good as the area in which it's registered. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just expanding on, on the concept of territoriality, there are certain time periods within which you need to file your patent application. So you've made the disclosure, not the disclosure, you've invented the product. Right. You go to your patent attorney, you file your application at the patent office. There's various means, but it's beyond the scope of this uh, program to go into the detail of those processes. Um, but let's say you only elect to file a patent application in South Africa. Right. That is where your protection starts and stops. If somebody else in China wants to utilize the benefit of your invention, they're more than welcome to do so. In fact, it would be perfectly legal because if you do not enter uh, the Chinese territory with a patent application, you're actually gifting your invention right. to, well, everyone in whichever territories you don't have pre uh, patent protection in. So with regard to, uh, let's say, the um, uh, trademarks and, and domain names, now most companies have a website and it identifies the brand of that company. Now, often you would find uh, overseas agents phoning you and saying, look, uh, somebody's trying to steal your brand here, for, for example, in Hong Kong or China, and they would offer to uh, assist you in protecting your brand for, for quite a sizable amount of money. Now, I think earlier on you were speaking about identify your market and see where you want to protect that idea. Uh, you gave a very interesting example of the burn uh, dressing. Just, just let's take us through that again. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. And market protection in a particular area. Okay. Um, look, patenting costs. Let's, let's start off from, from this point. Patenting costs can sometimes be prohibitive, especially to a startup company looking to enter into certain markets. Um, marketing costs, as you've pointed out, is sizable. Tooling and development costs are sizable. And in addition to all of these very necessary processes, you now have on top of that patenting costs. Right. So it doesn't make sense for you to throw money um, into um, a company that's simply running away with expenses. Right. You have to select very carefully your market that uh, you're going to be active in or potential markets that you will in future be active in. Um, very, very, very few companies, in fact, I know of not more than five or six companies that would consider going into as many jurisdictions as uh, they can, up to 146 countries by way of patent protection, and right. these represent sizable costs. But it makes no sense if you're going to have a patent granted in China when your primary market is in Pakistan, for that matter. Um, I know of a South African company that had a product. Um, it related to burn wound dressings, and they attempted filings in, in several territories, but found once they started becoming commercially active that their primary market was in fact Pakistan. Right. And that's where they had uh, patent protection in and where they focused their effort in, in order to generate revenues. Um, patents are not obligatory. It's a voluntary thing that you can, you can do, but the benefit of a patent is to provide a monopoly for a limited time period so that you can operate in that space and you can take full advantage of the commercial opportunities that a patent would, would provide for you to the exclusion of everybody else within their territory. So the market that would be defined by your product is 100% accruable to you on the assumption that your patent is a valid patent. Right. Moment, I'll ask, us, I'll ask you to pause there. We're going for another ad break and we'll be back with you after the short break. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the last section of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. And tonight we're covering the very important and interesting topic of patents and intellectual property, copyright, trademarks and designs. Designs we really haven't had time to touch on yet, Mohamed, but if we just talk up, uh, take up on the last uh, theme that we were dealing with, the uh, monopoly that you afforded and the financial advantage of the patent. What does a patent do to a company's bottom line? Well, um, the primary purpose of, of a patent or a design right or a trademark for that matter, 
And in fact, this principle extends to confidential information as well. Not only provides you with the space to compete against your direct competitors uh, to your own advantage, it also, once you start earning revenues, can be reflected as an asset in your balance sheet. And depending on how successful those commercial processes are, the amount that, that could be reflected in respect of these intellectual property rights in most scenarios far exceed the value of uh, your land, your buildings and your equipment put together. Now is that a tax advantage if you sell it? I mean, what's the tax advantage of having a patent or an asset uh, or an intellectual property in your company? Well, um, the tax advantage that I know of is that if you conduct research and development in your company, um, there are certain provisions under our tax laws which entitle you to uh, a tax rebate. Um, obviously, a tax law specialist would be able right. to point you to the particular provision. But, but, but there is like a myth that if you have an uh, invention or a patent uh, and you can sell that separately or you know, from the company, that invention of patent is not taxed in the same way as the normal assets of the company. Is, is, that, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, well, the, a lot, the bulk of the consideration would be whether or not that particular patent as an asset is an income generating um, um, asset or if it's capital in nature. And then obviously that would guide your tax practitioner on what to claim back from the tax man. Um, but there are other considerations for tax purposes that one needs to bear in mind. And this resides in, um, um, I forget the term now, but basically if you're going to produce intellectual property in one jurisdiction and assume you have a licensee or manufacturer in another jurisdiction, right. and you later decide to combine the two manufacturing concerns and your administrative concern in a single house, there could be serious tax implications. So it is very important to consult your tech, uh, not only your tax practitioner, but your patent attorney up front when you decide to, to utilize the benefits of patent laws or design laws. Um, and to also have a business plan um, that one could understand where are you going to manufacture, um, where are you going to house your administrative capabilities, are these going to be under one roof, what sort of licensing arrangements are you going to enter into? Do you have foreign markets or is there potential to tap into those foreign markets? It becomes very complex um, if you don't deal with it up front All right. because then you're constantly dealing with it in hindsight and trying to recover your position as opposed to having a plan to map out exactly where you want to be, say in the short term, in five years from now. Well, look, it's interesting because, um, you know, the, the South African companies are now expanding at a tremendous rate uh, into the African and European market. Just recently, we know last week or two weeks ago, the Nando's mark received a huge accolade when uh, the British uh, Prime Minister ate at the Nando's and, and then it was splashed all over the world. So it's, it brought huge interest in the Nando's mark. I think they, they're sitting in about 1,500 stores at the moment and expanding. So that's a, a you know a home uh, uh, a home success story and now an international success story, but I, I'm just thinking well, what would he do for you know in respect of the franchise? So how does it benefit uh, benefit him to open branches across uh, the world? Well, um, the answer really lay in. It's the sorry, moment. It has to be a very short oh. uh, answer because we're nearly coming to the end of our show. Sure, the answer is globalization. The world is becoming a smaller place. And the trading space for markets is becoming more accessible, especially by South African innovators. You don't want to enter into, let's say, the UK market or the US market without any protection right. in respect of your brand, in respect of your trademarks. If you have a patentable subject matter, you want to ensure that those um, products falling within the scope of those patents are protected before you enter those markets to avoid um, what competition would, well, or somebody competition. taking up your mark. Yeah. Or for anyone uh, entering into your, your space and competing on equal footing. Mohamed, I have to stop you there and I thank you very much for having taken the time and trouble for having prepared for this and attending tonight. For me, it was certainly a very, very interesting topic. 
I'm sure that our viewers uh, have benefited tremendously from distinguishing the matters of patents, copyrights and trademarks. And uh, thank you and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to a, another episode of Legal Ease, the show that converts legal jargon into legal ease. Tonight uh, we will be discussing the Human Rights Commission and uh, my very special guest tonight is Advocate Muhammad Shafi Amir Mia, whom I will introduce in a moment. Now, the Human Rights Commission is similar uh, to the public protector in that it derives its powers from the Constitution. So it's a Chapter 9 organization, and we will talk a lot more about the uh, creation of the Human <coughs> Rights Commission. But by and large, the Human Rights Commission is there to promote and protect and advance uh, the human rights of uh, the citizens. And um, it's a very, very important part of uh, the constitutional democracy and the development of a uh, culture of human rights uh, in, in South Africa. Um, advocate Mohammed Shafi Amir Mia is an advocate of the High Court. He has a BA, LLB and a Master's in Laws. He did a, um, a certificate course in business administration and for a long time he was um, legal advisor in the Limpopo um, government. Um, Advocate Amir Mia has also obtained a fellowship from an American university. Uh, Shafi Amir Mia, Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Legal Ease. Wa alaikum salam, Shaf. Um, Thank you very much to ITV and to, for uh, receiving me here today. I think it's an exciting platform to share our experiences from the Commission with all South Africans and the public at large. Now, in terms of um, the creation of the Human Rights Co uh, Commission, what are we to understand by its creation and how was it created? Okay, Ashraf, what we think, I think what we should be understanding is that the Human Rights Commission is, um, is an independent institution. It's, a, it's an institution that supports constitutional democracy. And it was, inter it was established in terms of Chapter 9 of the Constitution. Its specific mandates are set out in the legislation section 184 of the Constitution. And broadly, we are saying that the South African Human Rights Commission, we are mandated to do the following, promote, and res promote respect for human rights and create and a culture of human rights promote the protection, development, and attainment of human rights, and monitor and assess the observance of human rights in the Republic. In this regard, what we, the Commission, we have the necessary powers as regulated by national legislation to perform the functions, including to investigate and report on the observance of human rights, to take the necessary steps to secure appropriate redress where human rights have been violated, and to carry out research and to educate and every year, uh, we must, as a commission, we must, as a commission, uh, uh, we require of the organs of state to provide information on the measures of uh, what they, uh, towards the realization of socioeconomic rights concerning housing, healthcare, food security, education, and the environment. So, Shavi, that sounds extremely wide. Now, what are we to understand just by human rights i mean how is human uh, or what are human rights and how is it defined we have to contextualize uh, human rights in the sense that we must understand the, from the preamble of the constitution we're talking about rights uh, which are now entrenched in the bill of rights that we find in chapter two of the constitution um, these are entrenched rights of fundamental freedoms of every citizen of this country. And we must jealously guard those rights because we come from a very painful past, a history of oppression, of struggle, where people paid with blood for the attainment of the freedoms and that we have attained today. Uh, it is so jealously guarded that we have not only this, uh, the, uh, the, the, the South African Human Rights Constitution that has an, has an oversight role over these rights, but we have the Constitutional Court that jealously guards the fundamental freedoms that are entrenched in the, Bill of, in, in the Bill of Rights. But apart from the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, 
what other legislation informs or guides or um, educates us on, on uh, matters regarding human rights? Well, I think the fundamental principle is that we've got to look at the Human Rights Commission Act, which basically establishes the Human Rights Commission and gives us the powers uh, to, 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 um, to carry out our mandates. But then we have the Promotion of Access to Information Act, and we have a very important piece of legislation called the Promotion of Equality and the Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act. In short, it's called PAPUDA, and PAPUDA is basically... Um, you know, uh, that piece of legislation that, that, uh, that, that, overs, uh, that, that gives us teeth to look into violations of human rights based on discrimination, hate speech, um, and, uh, and those kind of violations that, that take place on a daily basis. I now, mean, again, I think a, a, a very vast and interesting subject regarding uh, human rights. Now, Shavi, with regard to um, the human rights aspect itself, W you know, you must have come across a number of interesting cases. Um, we know without without derogating from um, the the impact that we have. What exactly? Wh what would you say would be a very interesting case that you could recall? I think a very interesting case that I can bring to uh, what comes to mind immediately is this question of headscarves. That private schools are basically challenging, uh, you know, minority communities like Muslims. From, from, from wearing headscarves. Now, we, I know there's an international outcry about this, but the legislation is very clear. You cannot discriminate on the basis of religion. So even if it's a private school out there that has these kind of clauses, these clauses are basically outlawed in terms of the Constitution because the Constitution gives you those freedoms and the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. So if a public entity like a private school offers a public facility, they cannot use those discriminatory tactics. Because so basically what you're saying, rights. for example, if I attend any school, private or otherwise, then that school has certain dress codes. Let's say they say you may not wear a headscarf. That dress code or that rule cannot trump the provisions of the Constitution. The provisions of the Constitution says there would be no discrimination on the basis of race, religion, etc., and that school cannot impose that ruling on any child because it will be discriminating against that child. Is that, is that the way I understand it? Absolutely so. I think we are looking at competing interest. The right to a child's education. Right. As well as the right to a child's freedom. Now, obviously, it's a question of those rights in, in, in a competing environment that is now regulated by, which is, you know, we have the constitution that has an oversight role to play, right? right. To compete those interests, to come up with a fair dispensation yes. that, that addresses these kind of issues. Now, the fact that the child wears a headscarf, I mean, does not take away from the fact that the child has the ability to learn. I mean, the, the, the point of a school is to impart with education as, 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 a, um, as, um, as, a, as a service delivery uh, uh, model. Right. Now, the fact that the child wears a headscarf cannot take away from the fact that the child is any less than any other child in the school. Um, in the U.S., for example, there was a, a, a Jewish um, person that basically was in the army that wore that, uh, the, the yamulka, or the kippah. Mm -hmm. And the, the U.S. army then basically disciplined this person and obviously that was overturned as well on the basis that this, this person is a fit and per, per, a proper person, competent enough to serve the national interest, wearing that, the, the, the headgear that he had on. It didn't take away from, from the fact that it made him less of a soldier in that, in that situation. In fact, I think in the UK courts there was a similar decision regarding the Sikh child wearing a turban to school. And in that case, they said that, again, the, re the reasoning that you've just employed, uh, that it didn't take away the ability to learn any, any kind of uh, religious uh, aperture. But before we come to uh, any further points, uh, the right to education, the right to education is a human right. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Now, recently, we've seen some tragic news regarding a young boy 
that was um, that was found dead in a in, in a pit toilet in one of the provinces. Now, how does that how do how how do those two rights now compete? The right to an education and the right to sanitation is that a human right? It's a fundamental right, um, Ashraf, in the sense that look, you know, it was it was it was it was a very heartbreaking story. A child goes to school one morning in the quest for education in a public institution. The Department of Education has the money to build a proper school with proper sanitation. Right. And there's a dereliction of duty resulting in the tragedy that happened. And when we had these hearings in Parliament, the mother of the child came with us to Parliament and said, I need to say something here. I need to say to government that what has happened to my child is very painful. I'm in a state of mourning, but you know what? Please do not allow this thing to happen again in future. All right. Now, we as a Human Rights Commission took that water and sanitation report. We tabled it to Parliament and said to Parliament, right, as our obligation, yes. which is now to table these reports to Parliament and get Parliament to come up with an action plan to say that you show us how you will put um, pieces, you know, how you will put building blocks in, in place to ensure that these things never happen again. Going further... Sorry, just to interrupt. So this is, uh, this is a prerogative of the Department of Education, not public works. This is the Department of Education that has to see that there's proper toilet and ablution facilities for the students. Obviously... Um, yes, it is the, the department's, uh, Department of Education's responsibility. Yes. Although the implementation, uh, implementation agent is the Public Works, the right. Department of Public Works, but it does not absolve the Department of Education from ensuring that in future there will be clean running water. Yes. There will be textbooks that will be delivered on time. Right. There will be proper toilets for learners. Because you need to create a conducive learning environment. And these are all the necessary tools to create that enabling environment so that the child can get his rights or her rights within the parameters of the Constitution. So the textbook saga as well would also fall under the prerogative of the Human Rights Commission as well as the public protector. Is that right? Absolutely. Let me, let me just come and say to you that, you know, we need to have an understanding and appreciation of who the Chapter 9 institutions yes. are. Let us start. The first, uh, it's created in terms of Chapter 9 of the Constitution. Right. Right. And there's legislation to that effect. We've got the Public Protector. We've got the South African Human Rights Commission. We've got the uh, Independent, Independent the IEC. We've got the Auditor General. Right. We have the Commission for the Promotion and Protection of Cultural and Reli Religious and Linguistic Rights, which many people are not aware of. Yes. Right. So when you have a religious kind of problem, right? This is the commission that you lodge your, 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 your complaint to, right? Although we have concurrent powers, but what we then do is, obviously, we will engage with our sister organizations, right? Yes. And we will address the problem and try as best as we can to ensure that the rights that have been entrenched and enshrined in the Constitution, in particular Chapter 2 of the Constitution, are, 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 are not violated. And therefore, we need to engage the process. What do we do? We, we will monitor and, uh, the situation to see if there's a violation of human rights. Right? We must be able to, we then, in terms of our, not only national, but it's our international obligation as well, yes. to advise government, parliament, and any other body on the specific violations. Because sometimes people violate rights without knowing, they, without knowing that they are violating those but, rights. But may I just, I mean, I think that's a very interesting point, that uh, a right can be violated without a person knowing it. I just want to invite the callers, the, the viewers, <coughs> to call uh, our uh, distinguished guest if you have any questions on 011 086-7701-2 stroke or 3. Uh, you're most welcome to call in. Shall we, just on the point of a uh, violation of a national right based on religion, um, you know we have um, uh, the Eid al-Adha. Now, some people insist on slaughtering not at established abattoirs. Uh, they might go to a farm or some people might, might have land big enough to, to do that. But recently the SPCA has been intervening in these uh, 
saying that uh, such slaughter is uh, it really amounts to um, maltreatment of the of the animals. Now, in in certain traditional societies, I think in African societies and things, there's also ritual slaughtering. Now, how how am I how am I to reconcile my rights, the right to carry out a, an obligation, uh, obviously without uh, you know breaking any bylaws. Uh, and, and reconcile it with the, um, let's say, the um, African custom, uh, where the SPCA would then come and say to you, no, but you can do it, but somebody else, or you can't do it, and somebody else can. With That's regard very, to, to, to the protection of religious rights. That's a very interesting uh, question that you raise. Um, and I think this is where society needs to understand uh, that, you see, this is where we need to engage we as a Human Rights Commission can take a complaint like this and then we can sit with our sister organization, the Commission for the Protection and Promotion of Religious and Cultural Linguistic yes. Commission. We can then get a committee of experts. We can then look into ways of resolving this matter that can address the needs of the, of, of the Muslim community in this, in this case yes. as well, uh, as well as also uh, secure, you know, securing those rights within a broader community. Yes. Because you must remember the Constitution talks about diversity and it talks about social cohesion. That diversity and social cohesion demands respect for each other's cultural practices as well. Right. Although these are not absolute, okay, but there are limitations to those rights, but through a, 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 the process of mediation, right, you can come to amicable solutions and say that, okay, how do you do it? I mean, how is it done? You need to have an understanding and yes. appreciation of all the, the dynamics that goes into, into, into a, a simple thing like how to slaughter an animal. Okay. But where would my relief reside? Uh, would it be with the Human Rights Commission or another commission? Before you answer that question, I'd like to once again remind the viewers to uh, you're welcome to call with any questions that you may have. And the number is 11 stroke 2 or 3. I'd like to also pause at this stage and just um, inform you that we'll be back after this very short commercial break. Please stay tuned. We'll be back after the break. On a sunny South African day up in the sky, two friends were sailing on a rather peculiar ship. Captain Jim and Chip were their names. They had the ultimate special recipe for most perfect fish and chips to share. They also had secrets to the great recipes like this. The JK47, a roll with poloni, a Russian, chips and cheese for only 36 rand. And now, Captain Jim and Chip are here to stay. Legendary fish has anchored. Jimmy's Fish and Chips, the addictive taste. Park Avenue Stationers is one of the leading independent office supplies companies in the country. We are motivated by a strong desire to deliver service excellence by simply doing it better. Get unbeatable prices and select from a wide range of products for all your needs. Printers, paper, office supplies, school supplies and everything else in between. We are the vendor of choice. Park Avenue Stationers, HP preferred partner, your office supplies specialist. IBO have become synonymous with world-famous brands which are now available to discerning clients at their store just off Marlboro Drive in Santon. We feature a wide selection of fine branded shirts as ideal accessories to quality suits and jackets available in-store at affordable prices. So come visit us today or give us a call. IBO, international brands at the best prices. Sailies Travel Bags are wholesale suppliers of luggage suitcases direct to the public. We stock Samsonite, Cellini, Delsi and Polo. We also have the latest handbags, school bags, purses and wallets. So if quality is what you're looking for at great prices, then visit our showroom at number 9 Gold Reef Road or Mondi Johannesburg today. SA's leading bathroom design store, offering exclusive products and the world's leading brands in sanitary wear, taps, 
tiles and bathroom fittings. Why settle for less when you can have the best? We offer value for every budget. Visit our exclusive showrooms to experience why we are different. Exclusive brands, customer service, variety, value and backup support. Classic Trading. Luxury Bathrooms. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the second half of Legal Ease. Once again, I remind you, the lines are open and viewers are welcome to call in on 011086 stroke 2 or 3. And the number will appear on your screen. Uh, Shafi, we were talking very interestingly just before the break about the rights to slaughter animals and, and where I should be taking, let's say the objection is raised by the SPCA. I mean, the official comes around and says, you know, you're not supposed to do this, that, the other. And you say, but it's my human right. It's my right to practice my religion freely and openly. Where, how does one deal with such an a, uh, incident? Okay, going to the nuts and bolts of it. Yes. What, what, what you do is, in all nine provinces, we have provincial offices. Right. And each province, a provincial office has a provincial manager. And we have a team of legal experts in that. So your first point of call is to go to the provincial office there right. and to lodge your, your complaint there. Right. Obviously, within time frames, your access to justice and your remedies will, will then follow through from there. Right. Okay. Um, Obviously, it also depends on the complexity of issues. If we think, obviously, that our sister organizations must come in as well, the other Chapter 9 institutions, like the Commission for the Promotion and Cultural uh, and Religious and Linguistic, or let's call it the CRLs, yeah. the Commission of Religious and Linguistic yeah. uh, Communities, <clears throat> if they need to come on, we set up, any, we set up a formal meeting. So your, your we, powers are vast. I mean, they, it sounds like the extra, they, they judicial powers in a way, uh, and you can you can flow over to other organizations. You're not ring fenced only to deal with it in the, in terms of the Human Rights Commission. Well, our primary focus is the Human Rights Commission Act. Right. And we've been given the quasi judicial powers to, within those to act. Right. But as part of the mediation, yes, it does not prevent us from from resolving the issues by bringing other stakeholders on board, trying to come to an amicable solution. Right. In in this in this case. And in nine out of ten, you, you, you do find your solutions uh, in, 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 in going through accessing your remedies through, through that avenue. Now, now let, let's take a different scenario. Let's say I want to build a mosque, okay, and uh, I've applied for permission for rezoning, etc., and the permission is refused. Where, where would my relief lie? Would I, where, would I have to go to court or what do I have to do? Well... You see, in, in terms of Chapter 3 of the Constitution, right, uh, there are mechanisms, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Mm. Obviously, the violations are, obviously, the violations are Chapter 2 violations, the freedom of religion. Yeah. Right. But now you're looking at a broader perspective. You're looking at Chapter 3 yes. of to do the ADR, the alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Right. You, you then, we as a commission basically will say, okay, let's call the municipality. Now, in terms of pipe, so, so do I like lay a complaint to the Human Rights Commission? Yes, that's your port of call. Right, right. So we, we would call the stakeholders. The stakeholders is you, the complainant, right, and the, the municipality that's not addressing the issue. Yes, and we say, okay, in terms of paya, yes. give us your reasons why you turned it down. Now, just to give you one example, many, no, many just, just just before you okay. go, let's just make the public understand what is paya. There oh, yes. are certain okay. norms and rules. When, a, when exercising a public function that an administrator of public uh, fu uh, duties has to take. So when he makes his decision, right, in terms of power, just tell us how he, he reaches that decision because you're now questioning him, how did he make that decision in terms of power? Obviously, because then you can take this, that decision on review. Yes. Right. Now we have quasi-judicial review powers. Yes. Now we can ask him, give us reasons for your reason for dismissing the application. So he, he, has, he doesn't have to display bias, it must be well thought up, uh, it must not be illogical. Th those are some of the precepts Correct. of PAJA, right? Uh, of PAJA. PAJA, and, yeah. and obviously PAJA comes directly into, yeah. into play here. Uh, the, the lawfulness of the action yes. is a determining factor. Right. So 
the idea is that that person is not a law unto himself. Right. Uh, it's, it's a public functionary holding a public post, delivering a, a, a public a judgment in the public interest. So you as a person who's, a, who's, who's been aggrieved by that decision yes. are then entitled to, in terms of paya, ask for those kind of uh, uh, reasons why... From the official. From the official. Right. Now, so he's cited in his personal capacity. You don't call the minister. and he, You call the, the official that actually made the, the decision. Is that right? No, no. You, you, you call him in his representative capacity. Yes, of course. But yeah. obviously, uh, uh, he's, he's an official who's a, who's a functionary in terms of the Administrative Justice Act. Yeah. So okay. in other words, you don't cite the minister or the MEC. You cite the official personally. Look, you, as one Mr. Of the X. Right. As one of the, you'll say that the municipality to come to is the, the first commission. respondent. And obviously, the, this thing, uh, yes, of course. Yeah. The municipal manager and obviously the official who then. Uh, so, I mean, it, it sounds very onerous for. I mean, it's personal. The guy has to come and give personal uh, evidence. There. Yes, he's going yeah. to tell you what was the basis that informed his right. decision. Now, I'll give you one example. You see, a couple of years ago in, in, in Zanin, in Limpopo, yes. the, the, the Muslim community out there wanted to build a mosque in the center of town. It has never happened before in the past. So it was post democracy now, post 1994. Right. So what had happened was the, the, the churches objected to it. Ah, okay. the churches objected. The, the churches objected yes. to it. So the municipality was reluctant to approve the plan. Would Isn't it, that a bit strange? I it's mean, very another, yes. another faith opposing a place of worship uh, of, of another faith. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit strange. Yes. It is strange. But what had happened was just to show that how people cannot act high handedly. Yes. What had happened was the Muslim community out there basically took the matter up to the provincial government. Right. Where the premier himself intervened in that matter and said, no, if you as a church is obj objecting to this, the creation of the, uh, the, the establishment of the mosque in the, in the center of town, yes. what is the basis of, of, of your reasoning? Now, it's ludicrous what the answer was. They said, look, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Right? This is a response of the, the church. Of the church. Yes. Okay. And then they said, okay, they're the fastest growing religion. And you know what? This site is too small for them. So the premier then in his wisdom said, listen, uh, how many churches do you have here in this town? Zanini is a small town of about 6,000 people. Yes. They said, we have 38 churches. He said, well, if these people need more land uh, and more space, we'll give them that. But I'm just giving you that as an example that a functionary in a municipality cannot be a law unto himself. Right. Right. And therefore, you need to engage the process. Now, at the Human Rights Commission level, what's happening is you, you have those quasi-judicial powers. Obviously, you'll knock at the doors of the provincial offices. Right. And, that if you cannot, and if you cannot get your remedies there, you have a process where you can appeal to us as commissioners. Right. We then take all the facts on a stated case now because we have heard both sides of the story. And then we come to a conclusion that's in the interest of the uh, within the Bill of Rights. And you give a just decision on that basis. And once again, a reminder to our viewers to call in on 011086-7701-2 or 3. Shavi, I think a very interesting um, point would be uh, a discussion on application of um, the, the rights. Now, we have vertical application and you have horizontal application. W what do we understand by those terms? Now, I think that's a very, very interesting question you ask. Vertical, simply to put, vertical uh, rights are rights between a citizen and the state. Right. Okay. And horizontal is between an individual, a private citizen and a private citizen. For example, so a school a and school, a, a student. A private, exactly, a private school or an, an student. Or it could be it could be you and your neighbor as well. Right. For example, a neighbor a neighbor calls you uh, by your, a, a derogatory and offensive name. Yes. It it is against the foundational values of this constitution, yes. which is right to dignity. Right. Right. And the, the point of reference, what you do with that person is, you take the person to the equality court in terms of uh, legislation. Uh, right. You go to the human rights commission. You lodge your complaint at the provincial district within the framework of the prevention, promotion of uh, equality and the prevention of unfair discrimination act, yes. you then access your rights and say this person is, uh, has been... So you have dual remedies. You have dual remedies. Right. Okay. And obviously what happens is you, it doesn't have to stop there. You can, if you are not happy with those power, with those, with the decision of the uh, this thing, you can take it up to the constitutional court because the constitutional court is the highest court. And, and what kind of sanction can you expect uh, let's say between neighbor and neighbor, 
What kind of sanction can you expect the Equality Court to hand down? Like an apology or is there a fine to be paid or, or, or I mean, what, what, what? Uh, okay. Um, the sanctions can vary, Ashraf. It's it, 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 it's based on each case, it's, it's based on its, you know, it's on its own merit. Give you one example. A uh, couple of years ago, our former chairperson, uh, Mr. Collipin. Yes. Um, was he's judge now. He's judge Collipin yeah. now, yes. He was walking down the street in Pretoria and he went to a barber shop. Yes, a I white recall barber shop. Yes. So that was a very interesting case. And it was a white barber shop that said it will it, only cut hair for white people. Yes. And Mr. Co uh, Judge Collipin took it upon himself to, to say that that's very offensive because this is a public, you know, it's a, it's a public service. Yes. And this barber was taken to task by the magistrate. So the sanction there was that, okay, the barber cannot, so you ask the barber, why can't you, why didn't you not cut, why, why, can you, why could you not cut Mr. Collip and say, and he said, well, I'm not used to cutting people uh, of different shades and colors. I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, groomed in the art of cutting there. So the magistrate then said, no, you need to learn. So that was a kind of a punishment. So and the sanction was you must go and take lessons to learn how to cut hair. Yeah, oh, right. and very uh, interesting. I mean, if it's a Rastafarian, you must know how to do his dread, dreadlocks as well, you see. Well, look, I, I think the important point that you also made was that the magistrate's court would be the start, the forum. So it sounds like an inexpensive procedure. Uh, is, is that so? Or does it cost you a lot of money to, to take the matter to the Equality Court? I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that question because... The Equality Court was particularly created and established for that purpose, to make access to justice easy, simple, and you get speedy remedies. Now, each magistrate court in this country is an Equality Court, okay? If you are not happy with the decision of the Equality Court at the magisterial level, then you can take it to the High Court, which has the, 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 the necessary jurisdiction to address the issue. So your powers can go right up to the Constitutional Court, where fundamental freedoms and rights are affected. You can take them to the highest court in the land. It's interesting that, uh, that you say that um, the, the, the sanction was, um, as you said it was, that the guy had to go and learn how to cut hair. Because just this week in America, there was a very, very interesting decision. A neighbor who abused his neighbor for almost 15 years and the woman uh, that he abused uh, had two ch children that were, uh, were physically handicapped and of, not of the same race. And uh, I think the neighbor, the, the main, um, you know, the, the older neighbor who was abusing this woman by throwing dog feces and screaming at her and her children, was asked by the judge to sit with the sign at the intersection saying, I'm a bully, I'm a racist. I treat my, uh, d uh, uh, disabled people unfairly. I mean, it, it was the public humiliation that he meted out was actually sent back to him, and he, he had to sit with the sign for at least a day. Uh, and I think uh, that itself might have been a, a, a learning, um, uh, a, a lesson for him. Um, just to come back now to um, a horizontal application, we spoke about neighborly rights. Now, what about my rights as an employee? Let's say uh, I, I want to go to Juma, okay, or uh, I want to take time off for Eid. What, what, you know, and, and my employer says, no, uh, you can't go for Juma. What, 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 where, do I, where does my, do I go to the CCMA with that complaint or do I go to the human rights or what do I do? Well, you can go to the CCMA, but you must come to the Human Rights Commission because it's, it's a violation of your religious freedom your right to, to practice your religion. Right. Now, if, if, uh, if, if, if you don't, um, you, you know, the, the point is um, the Constitution, you know, the preamble of the Constitution yeah. talks pertinently about the very same issue. We're looking at the foundational values of our Constitution is based on dignity. Right. Dignity, respect, right? And... Uh, and, 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 and the respect for the rule of law. Right. Now, respect, what are we saying? We're talking about social cohesion. We're called, you know, communities never lived in the past together. They're living together. Yes. Right. So they, there's an element of respect that, that, can, that it must be factored into the whole equation. Then over and above that, you have uh, the right to practice your religion. Now, for example, let's take a simple example. I'm quite surprised 
that in this country till today, the, the, the religious bodies from the other faiths have not taken the government to, to task for, 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 for declaring two holidays. Right. I mean, take Easter Friday. I'm a, I'm a, you know, you're a Muslim, right? Yes. We are Muslims. We want to go to work. It's a public holiday. Okay? So you are forced to take that holiday. And it's a paid holiday. Take Christmas. So those are two holidays that you no, have. No, well, you have Easter Monday as well. Easter Monday. Yes. Right? So why, why cannot the, the, the Hindu community, right, that have two Diwali's a year, raise those same things, the same uh, objections? Right. Why cannot the Muslim community say that, listen, we also have two Eids here. Right. Why can't we exercise those rights within, within the parameters of the constitution and, the, and legislation? Right. Now, obviously, it will, be unfair, it will be an unfair labor practice that if you can give to one community, you cannot give to another community. Right. Okay? So that equality principle has never been tested. Okay. But it is not for us to decide that. I mean, it's for communities to come forward. So and what say. you're saying is people have to be proactive about their rights. Consider the, their discriminations and then determine what they're going to do. Before you answer that, uh, we have to take another short ad break and we'll be back after this break. Situated in the heart of Johannesburg, on Moy Street, Lindsay Saker offers you the greatest deals on new and used cars. Included on site is our parts department, which caters for and supplies the VW range. Here we offer full car servicing and a range of additional maintenance work. Lindsay Saker, Johannesburg CBD. Lot 100 Marhaba Gummies has the juiciest flavoured gummies. Like Fantasy Gummies, new sour flavour now available. Fruit Tube Gummies in assorted black currant and mango flavour. Usly Snakes, Sharks and Bears. Sour Bears and Lot 100 Fruit Flavoured Gummies with real fruit juice and vitamin C. Lot 100 Gummies, spice up your day, taste it, you'll love it. Another quality product from Marhaba Trading. Spice Mecca's newly packaged spices, categorized by spicy orange, exotic red, natural green, and magical purple. Use our blends and seasonings, masalas, herbs, or pure ground and whole spices to create yet another unforgettable taste experience. Choose your color, choose your number. We have your taste. So come on, do it the Spice Mecca way, the cook easy way. Lifestyle Ceramics. Design your lifestyle. Since 2006, Adega Fordsburg has been bringing you the finest Portuguese food. From our five-star seafood to the finest grilled chicken and delicious steaks. It's easy to see why Adega Fordsburg has become a favorite in the community. Our fine dining experience is perfect for your family functions, special occasions and corporate events. We're not just a restaurant, we're your restaurant. At Dega Fordsburg, always open, always good. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to the last section of Legal Ease, the show that takes legal jargon and turns it into Legal Ease. Uh, Shafi, we were just talking about, uh, just before the break, we were talking about being proactive regarding one's rights and we were talking about uh, public holidays and, and how it appears to be discriminatory against minority groups because, as you pointed out, uh, there, there are four uh, Christian public holidays and two or less um, uh, exercised by everyone else which uh, is basically uh, an unpaid holiday. So you can take off for Eid and you can take off for uh, Diwali, but you're not getting paid for that. And you asked, uh, well, I think you made a, a valuable suggestion that people should examine their rights and see what they could do um, with them. 
Uh, with regard to um, a further exploration of rights, uh, let's say, um, uh, you know, a, a, um, uh, a Rastafarian would like to appear, uh, let's say, in, um, in, in court. And, uh, and he says, look, I'm being discriminated against uh, uh, the, uh, you know, my, my belief because my belief says that part of my uh, experience or religious experience is celebrated with marijuana. Is that a kind of right that, that he would be able to bring to the Human Rights Commission? Technically speaking, yes. And I think on that particular score, the Constitutional Court has already ruled on that, yes. on that and in the Prince case. Yes. You know? so, so the law is quite clear on that, on, that, on that district. But I think let's go back one step. And let's look at why people are not becoming proactive. Is it because we have taken our rights for granted? In 20 years that we're celebrating our democracy this year, is it that people have just said, okay, now this is a constitution and this constitution is the supreme law of the land and it covers all rights and obligations and responsibilities. Now, I think what is happening right now is that people are not aware of their rights. Yes. The simple reason is because people don't read. Right. There's nothing preventing you from taking a constitution and opening from chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Right. Chapter one is a preamble of the constitution. What does it say? It says we recognize the injustice of the past. What were those injustices? Those injustices were things like detention without trial. We had people like Ahmed Timor that was thrown down, Imam Abdullah Harun that had died uh, in detention. Now, now, now that you raise right? Imam Abdullah Harun, I think that's a, a, a very important point to try and discuss. What I'd, I'd like to just take the first caller. Caller, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, Shafi, uh, Who's speaking? Shafi? Bo you can address Shafi, yes? Okay, can I speak to Shafi, please? Yes, please go please ahead. Go ahead sir. Hello, Shafi? Yes, sir, I'm listening. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Farooq speaking. How are you, Farooq? Farooq, you know which Farooq? Um, From Victoria? Yes, yes, Farooq, of course. Uh, everything okay? Fine, fine. Let's yeah, hear your that's question, That's a very good Farouk. point you mentioned about public holidays. If there was e Diwali, and if there's a Jewish holiday, but then you will have so many holidays, no working days. Let me. Well, well, what is your, question, your question exactly, uh, Farouk? That's a very good point because we at the moment following the English calendar. That means tomorrow is not a Juma holiday; it's a Good Friday. It's also a Good Friday. So that means we are following the English calendar. But if it was an Islamic, uh, we following the Islamic way. Then we will have uh, eat two holidays. We'll have, you know, many other holidays too. Shall we? You want I to think, elaborate on? Yeah, I think Farouk, let, let 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 me elaborate what I'm saying is, look. Okay, look, I'll I'll, I'll lay on a radio. Okay, no I'll, problem. I'll listen on a TV. Sorry. No problem. Thank you. The point I'm making is that look, the Muslims can celebrate those two days, and the Hindus can celebrate those two days holidays. Right. The rest of the workforce can go back. And these people that are celebrating their holidays, it is within their religious freedoms. So therefore, they should be paid for it. That's the point I'm making. It doesn't mean the whole country must come to a standstill because of, 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 uh, uh, of, of, uh, of those two holidays that are there. The rest of the country can go to work. Okay? But they must respect you for observing those rights. That's the point I'm making. Well, I think, I think that's adequately answered. Shall we... Um very interestingly, when we talk about the application, where we're talking about Imam Harun, I think we need to just, um, you know, deal with this uh, uh, issue. Because, you, you know, I mean, he's a stalwart. Or he's been honored in many, many fora. Um, and um, the memory of, of uh, a struggle hero of uh, the nature, of the statue of Imam Harun, uh, is also the, the knowledge is, uh, you know, is diminishing. The, the memory is diminishing. But I think there's been a, a, a revival in trying to understand what he was and who he was and what he stood for. In the context of human rights, how, we, how, how would we position uh, the uh, Imam Harun? I think Imam Harun, Steve Biko, Ahmad Timol, they all form part of that category of, and Solomon Mashlangu, are people who, who, whose history we need to know. Yes. It is a history that our children need to know. It is a history that goes beyond. Because when people forget their history, then we become history. We'll go into the dustbins of history. Just to give you one example, 
the police are not supposed to use excessive force yes. in, in carrying out their duties. In the apartheid days, they did that. Yes. They carried out these excessive forces. Imam Abdul Harun was a victim of that. He died in detention. He was tortured. Okay. It is at a TRC level where Amr Timol was vindicated where they said that what they did, what the police did to him was a gross violation of human rights. Yes. Now, this is things that, that, that needs to be incorporated into the school curriculum. Children need to know that, you see, because what happens is you create a responsible citizenry yes. that understands where we come from, understands that we, what we should not be doing, and understand that in order for us to reach that egalitarian society that we're looking for, right, we, we must do certain things and we must prevent certain things from happening. Now, police brutality, for example, that happens. Yes. Take Brits. A yeah. child go and ask for water, right? Mm. It is the fault of a municipality for three years. They do not come to the party to give water. When you ask for water, they shoot a child dead. Mm. But then why the mines down the road, right, are getting yes. free water? They're stealing water. Right. Yeah? Those kind of issues. Now, those are gross violations of human rights. Right. When the communities go up in, in, in service delivery protests, yes. they're asking for their bra basic bread and butter issues. And, and it's a response. constitutional it's uh, guaranteed right that they're Absolutely. really asking for house to housing, sanitation, education, and food, food security. Absolutely. Now, when, 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 when police respond this way, then obviously it questions the, 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 the will of the state to make the difference. What changes did we envisage when the constitutional founding fathers and mothers tried to put this constitution together? It was to prevent those injustices from yes. happening in the past. Now, what happens is the accountability and good governance also comes to the question. Right. Right. The question that arises then is the municipality as an organ of state, right, cannot put the police in front to address the issues that they're supposed to be addressing. Right. Right. Police are there to protect our interests, to protect our rights. Right. They're not there to shoot people down for asking for water. Now, but equally so, there's a responsibility from the citizens yes that when they have a right to protest yes and they do protest and it is to ask for water and they cannot get it obviously they can you know do you have a right to protest but i mean i, th I think you know just to be fair you said that they were asking for three years i mean how much more do you ask and are they ha uh, on the other hand you see big industry swallowing up all the water resources in your area and you you just a little citizen uh, it is David versus Goliath, uh, and, and something has to give. But what you're saying is uh, responsible citizens, citizens should be able to read up the Constitution and act in terms of that. For example, access uh, the lower courts, the equality courts, the magistrates courts, and engage with government and call them and call the municipal managers for accountability to, to accountability. Not only the municipal managers, but also the mayors. The mayors. Okay, right. that's very as, interesting. As, as, I think as, most as people don't know. As, as, as a political uh, authority in in, in, a, in in the local setting. Right. Okay. You call you call the mayor, and the mayor cannot say that I will not address like what they did in Broncos Bay. The mayor said I will not go and talk to those people because they're angry. The right. question is, who makes them angry, and why are they angry? Yes. But equally so, when people do go and uh, demonstrate, yes, they should not burn down public facilities. Or, or like private Flint, property, like in Beckersdale. I mean, right? it's, uh, you should not be doing that. Yes, because there's an equal. The equality clause applies equally across the board. You cannot harm. You know, you cannot burn these things down, because you'll need these these facilities. Now, in, for example, like in Broncos Parade, those communities in that township of Zito Beni that burned down the clinic. Yes. The now have to now have to go and w go 20 miles down the road to go and look for a clinic for healthcare. Right. So it's counterproductive to what the, 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 you know, the problem statement was. But going well, back to Imam Abdullah Harun yes. and, and people like of his caliber that died for the vision for social, they, they died for freedoms yes. and they died for social justice that we envisage in the Constitution. We captured it in the preamble of the Constitution and we made sure that via the Bill of Rights, those things must never ever happen again. So the police need to act with restraint as well. Okay? Right. So obviously you need to have your community police forums. You need to be actively engaged in, in, in the security of your communities yeah. and so forth. Now, unfortunately, somewhere along the line, something is not giving. Well, it's I mean, let's take another practical example down. of what's not giving. Um, I know the, of a very interesting case where two lawyers, 
attended at the Santon police station uh, on behalf of their client. And they were racially abused by the policeman. I mean, he, he was quite deliberate in his words. Now, what can those two, and this is not even the client, this is the lawyers that were challenged uh, in, with racial insults by the policeman. And apart from the Independent Complaints Directorate, what, would, 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 would the Human Rights Commission intervene in such a matter? Absolutely, because I mean, that's fundamental. Yes. When you racially abuse somebody, uh, in, when they're trying to access their justice, of course, the Human Rights Commission must intervene. The point of call is you must go to the nearest uh, office. If it was in Gauteng, like in Senten, you, you go to the Gauteng office and you lodge, you lodge the formal complaint. Do you physically have to go or can you do this online? You can, how you can how do is online. the process? There is a complaints, for, there is a complaints uh, 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 format. A form. Right. You download it and you, you, you submit it in, uh, to, the, to the commission and let them. We've, they've got the legal team of experts. They look into the, the merit of the matter and address the issue. If need be, I mean, you can even call the, the National Police Commissioner to, 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 to order here. Now I mean, that's part of the, part of the, the, the deal. Yeah. Now, now, now you, you were saying earlier on that uh, the Human Rights Commission has the powers, um, ju has uh, judicial powers as well, uh, and it also has the powers of mediation. Now, let's say you're not happy with the outcome of your complaint or it hasn't received much attention. What does, how does one hold the Human Rights Commission accountable? Well, you, have, you, can, you can take our powers, you can take our de decisions on review to the High Court and ultimately to the Constitutional Court. But is there an internal mechanism as well? I, I mean, how far up must you go okay. before? The point, I, I, I get your point. I think the first point of call is w you go to the provincial office. Right. And obviously the matter will try to be resolved there. If you cannot, uh, you appeal against the decision. And obviously we as commissioners, I mean, there's seven commissioners yes. in the country, uh, right? Uh, five full-time and two part-time and the Commission will then listen to 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 the complaint as on a stated case right and as an appeals body we will make uh, our findings but if you're not happy with that then obviously you take it on review to the High Court or to the Constitutional Court but the precept of the High Court is that you can't approach the High Court until you've exhausted Correct. internal remedies yes yes uh, just to come back to uh, the point that we were making earlier on about uh, the late Imam Harun, he was uh, a stalwart, as you pointed out. And I'm very surprised to actually note that uh, these, um, uh, let's say, struggle stories, uh, as you pointed out, was the, was the backbone of what informed the uh, uh, drafters of the Constitution, uh, that it's actually not, not in the textbooks. I mean, uh, I, I didn't know that. Um, how do we entrench uh, the knowledge of, of human rights? I mean, I, I don't even see pamphlets or, or, or posters up. Is, is that a way of informing the public or, you know, what, what, what practical suggestions would you Look, have I for people to know how to, uh, um, how to maximize their human rights? I think the advocacy, uh, the advocacy uh, campaign you know, to make the advocacy awareness yes. programs that are there. Uh, obviously, you go onto the websites of the Human Rights Commission and also to, you know, like in Imam Abdullah Harun's case, yes. you know, uh, on the 27th of March this year, uh, the, the office of the president offer, uh, awarded him posthumously the Chief Albert Lutuli Gold Category Award, which is the highest award for his braver, bravery and for his self-sacrifice. In, in, in laying down his life for, for the principles of justice, social justice and freedoms that we are enjoying today. And that, uh, that was- I don't think many people actually know that the award yeah. was made. Uh. It, well, it happened on the 27th of March and obviously the Office of the Presidency uh, announced it and the, 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 the award will be conferred on, on, on him and it will be received by his family on the 27th of April, which is Freedom Day, which is also uh, historical. Yes. That on Freedom Day uh, in Pretoria, the presidential palace, uh, his family will come and collect the award on, uh, you know, for, for the bravery of, uh, of, of, of Imam Abdullah Harun. Now, Shavi, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I take the opportunity of um, uh, thanking you for uh, attending here tonight and informing us about a very, very important uh, um, 
organization, a, a, a chapter 9 organization created by the constitution, an independent body uh, entrusted with, the, with looking after human rights. Uh, I certainly have uh, been very, very um, uh, informed and educated by this great body. And um, thank you very much for, for taking the time and trouble. Would you like to just say goodbye to the viewers as well? Yes. Thank you very much to, to you and ITV and to, the, to all the viewers. I'd like to quickly say in conclusion, Ashraf, that we can, you know, one of the, 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 the strategic vision of the Human Rights Commission is basically to transform society, secure rights, and restore dignity. Yes. But we can only do this as a collective and therefore, I am saying, go and revisit the Constitution. We are going to make sure that as part of our project in the Human Rights Commission, we are going to ensure that in the coming years, in the, in the coming 12 months, yes. we are going to have this access to justice program that's going to become part of the life orientation in the Department of Basic Education. And we are going to ensure that that history is never forgotten so that ultimately we do transform society, we do secure rights, and we ensure that people are never uh, robbed of their dignity and again. And on that high note, we bid you farewell. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.